Author Ben Masrick, how you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Absolutely, and it's good to see you again. Last time we spoke, we were talking about your book, Bitcoin Billionaires, which was documenting the Winklevi's rise to Bitcoin fame and their empire that they're creating. And you're back with another book, and this one's The Anti-Social Network. And I am very curious about this book. But before you know, we get into my questions about the book, about why you wrote it, and your maybe your personal opinions about what's in it, uh, just give me a quick summary. What is it? Yeah, the anti-social network is the story of GameStop, the whole drama that happened earlier this year when a bunch of people sitting on their couches on Reddit drove the price of, of GameStop stock from in the 20s all the way to close to 500 in this massive short squeeze. Um, they took on Wall Street. It was a very David versus Goliath story where regular people tried to win for once uh, against you know these big multi-billion dollar funds that were shorting a beloved company. And so it's all about that drama. And there's less Winklevi in this story, but I think it's a really cool, compelling story about, you know, what's happening to the stock market and, and what's going on in finance. You know, that, that's where I want to get into your opinion, because, look, I am running for office on uh, Congress over here. I am a very pro big proponent of not only cryptocurrencies, but also uh, retail investors be able to, to um, engage with the financial products that are awarded to uh, rich people uh, for the most part. You know, to be able to buy stocks, to be able to get into the S&P 500, and buy indices and, and so on and so forth. And I always I, I looked at this as like the average person finally being included. How do you look at this whole like this whole development with GameStop, AMC, and so on and so forth? Yeah, I think there's a couple things going on. I do think that regular people finally have in their hands the tools of Wall Street traders. You know, Robinhood created this app that's very fun. It certainly does gamify Wall Street to a point where it makes it as easy as a video game. But there's no fees. You don't have to a certain amount. And with very little education, you can go on and buy and sell stocks. I mean, the double, the, the edge of that sword, the other side of that sword is that regular people also can lose a lot of money if they don't you know, have their eyes open and see what can happen. I think the drama of this and what's really cool about it and all the different layers of it is it shows the positive side, which is that everyone you know, should be a part of the economy. The more there are people on Main Street taking part in Wall Street, I think the better it is for everyone. But at the same time, there's a lot of gray and there's a lot of shadows and there's a lot of shadowy figures. And if you don't really have your eyes open, um, you know, there are dangers to, to, to everyone having the ability to do what a Wall Street trader does because the Wall Street traders have been doing this a long time and the game isn't necessarily fair. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot to look at here, um, but I, I think a regular guy on a couch now does have the power of someone in a suit and tie on Wall Street. Tell me a story, Ben. Tell me a story about that regular guy on the, on the couch that, you know, was just, you know, maybe risking a little bit of his hard-earned money, you know, making an average income. And, you know, that hard-earned money, maybe a $500 or $1,000 turned into something that was substantial that could pay off their house. Do you have any of those stories? Yeah, I do. In the book, uh, you know, there's the A story, which we've heard, you know, the Keith Gill taking on the hedge fund. But the story I also told was one character is this regular college kid who has a few thousand dollars. And he ends up making a quarter million dollars writing GameStop. And he did get out at the right moment and made a ton of money, you know, using his tuition money. Um, uh, there was another character, a woman um, who basically life hasn't been great to. She's a, a single mother of two, a um, couple of divorces. Um, she's an RN, um, has been working hard. Um, she's a Trump supporter because government really never did her any good. And she's got a, a lot of anger inside of her. She just wanted to make enough money to pay for her kids' braces. Um, so she got in but didn't really get out. Um, so, you know, there's both sides to this story. A lot of people did make a lot of money. Um, a lot of other people bought in at the heights and ended up losing money when Robin Hood froze trading on the whole situation. Um, and then there's the, the story of the main guy, Keith Gill, who's a guy in his basement in Brockton, Mass, which is a you know, blue collar suburb of Massachusetts, who was live streaming out of his basement because he fell in love with GameStop. And he turned $53,000 um, into $45 million. Um, but he still holds all that stock because he's crazy, <laughs> because he loves game stuff. So, you know, there are a lot of stories like that in the book um, of, of fortunes made and, and fortunes lost. Fortunes made and fortunes lost. I think after you talked, spoke to all these people um, and you started to hear their stories, there's times that you probably went into these conversations and you're high-fiving them because they made a quarter million dollars off of a couple thousand, um, $45 million uh, from his couch and, you know, rallying up um, uh, Wall Street bets. 
And then there's probably times that you walked away from these conversations that you were heartbroken with the the mom that was just trying to, you know, buy braces, but didn't get out in time and maybe even lost a little money. And it's hard earned money as an RN with, with, with kids. Um, did this ch- change or influence your opinion on these products that are being ro- rolled out? Like I said earlier, it's like, you know, the retail investor being uh, participants in the economy, I think is a good thing. But again, there is risks for people that are not trained with, you know, this kind of investment or this kind of, uh, you know, leverage of their, their their capital. Have you come on one side of the fence or the other when it comes to is this a good thing? Right. You know, it's a great question. And I think I came into it thinking this is a great thing because I love watching college kids make a tons of money. But the reality is the risk is not equitable. A guy on Wall Street can get out of a position lick his wounds and go back to his $30 million mansion. While a regular person who put $1,000 into a stock to watch it go down doesn't get that money back and doesn't go home to their mansion, they just lost the money they were gonna use for their rent. So the problem is, is that without any level of regulation, without with this just being the wild west, you're gonna see regular people get hurt a lot more than you're gonna see hedge funds get hurt. I mean, the hedge fund at the center of this story lost $5 billion. But guess what? They're still operating today. They're doing fine. They're going to probably rise all the way back up. And a lot of other people, you know, lost the money that they were going to use to pay their rent. Um, So something has to be looked at, uh, whether it's just financial education, whether, you know, along with your Robinhood app, you really have to go through some steps to know what it is you're getting into. But in the end, you know what? It's your money. And if you want to bet the house, you know, YOLO investing, you only live once, right? The thing that I found that most fascinated me was that people who don't have a lot of money take more risks than people who do have a lot of money. Because the reality is if you've only got $1,000, making 10% of your money is meaningless to you. Doesn't move the needle, doesn't change your life. Even doubling your money doesn't really mean that much to you. You need to make 10X or 20X or 30X. And so people bought GameStop and said, I'm not selling till it hits 1,000, which was completely insane. And when they bought it 20 and it hit 100, they didn't sell, even though they'd made five times their investment because 20 times their investment would really move the needle for them. And so you have to take that into account. It's a different thought process when you have less money than it is when you have a lot of money. You know, that's a very good point. And uh, I'm happy you brought that up because actually I was – on Colin app yesterday and I was talking about the same thing is that, you know, with different kind of, uh, when, when, when you do only do, you know, 10% gains, or even if you double your money and it's a thousand dollars, uh, having a thousand dollars profit is not going to be life changing to the average person. And you said something at the beginning of that is you said, it's not equitable. How would you make this more equitable for the average consumer, the retail investor, the mom and pop to, you know, invest into the stock market, take maybe less risk yet um, make it equitable so that they feel that they could invest but not lose t- tuition or braces? Yeah. I mean, I think one thing is there has to be much more visibility. You know, the, the shadowy nature of Wall Street is, is a big warning sign to me. The fact that hedge funds make these moves in the dark um, you know, you saw this short interest. There was 140% of the shares were short. How is that even possible? I mean, how is it possible that more shares than exist are on the short side? And then when Robinhood needs to stop trading on this stock, they basically closed out. Um, it wasn't clear to anybody who uses Robinhood that this could even happen, right? That suddenly they could say, all right, you can't, you can't buy any more. Um, And so all of that has to be made clear from the outset when you buy this stock. Um, And I think the GameStop story did make that clear to a lot of people. I don't think people are going in with eyes closed anymore. So I think it's important to tell stories like this. Um, I think it's important to talk about it. On the regulation side, I I think there really needs to be some level of, of education involved or at least signing off on what it is that you're doing. I think Robinhood and a lot of these companies are aiming at younger and younger audiences. And so college kids, 20-somethings with very limited financial backing are basically being sold a, a, a very strong and powerful tool and said, you can just bet all your money right now and there are no sort of fees, which is good, but the fact that there are no barriers means that, that anybody can do it and it's very easy to lose your money. So whether, you know, I don't have the answers to your question, which is actually a very complicated question. Because as a libertarian, as someone who believes that everyone should have the right to do whatever they want with their money, um, 
you know, I, I don't want to regulate the retail trader. I don't want to say you can't use your money in this. But I also want to say, you know, it's like it's like in Vegas when you're sitting at the blackjack table and you look like you're out of control. Um, there ought to be a, a moment where someone steps in and says, take a step back for a minute. Think about what you're doing and don't just go with it. Um, and Vegas doesn't do that very well, even though they're supposedly supposed to. Um, but on Wall Street, I think the same thing. I think Robin Hood should have in there somewhere be like that moment where some little character comes along and says, are you sure about this? <laughs> because it's your money, but you're probably going to lose it. I, I would like that to be somehow incorporated into the system. I, I like what you said there. And you know what? You know, I'm looking back at your uh, previous books. You know, there was Accidental Billionaires, uh, which is the Facebook uh, story and which uh, got turned into the movie uh, Social Network, if I'm correct. And then there is, you know, Bitcoin Billionaires, like I said, this one, Accidental, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Anti-Social Network. The theme that I see, and maybe you uh, in, in meant this, maybe I'm just grasping at straws with this, is that risk is involved in every one of them. In, in every story, there is somebody almost being as American as apple pie, taking a risk and becoming and, and, and making something bigger than themselves. And in this case, it was somebody taking a risk, organizing the average person and make and creating a movement that was bigger than themselves. With Facebook, Facebook is bigger than, you know, most governments at this point. And obviously the Winklevi are, are have their little empire. What does that tell you about people with risk? Because you, I just want to just juxtapose this, what you said about, you know, the risk is different between the average person and the billionaires that are investing. But it's very American to take the risk because we see that there are people that do take risks and achieve that greatness or that financial stability or that that um, success. What does this tell us about risk in the American spirit? And, and, and is that a theme that I'm just grasping at or is that something that you no, intended? I think it's totally like I'm fascinated by people who are we're willing to sort of risk everything and, and, and try and change the system or take on the system. I mean, that's what I've always written about is, you know, there are there are these big institutionalized systems like Vegas or Facebook or whatever, and people go out there and, and are willing to risk everything to try and beat it or bring down the house. And that does sort of pilot or fire, you know, all of these revolutions. And I'm definitely fascinated by it. And it's very American, the, the the idea that you can go out and really change the world as long as you're willing to risk everything. It's dangerous and it's scary or whatever, but that those are the stories that, that I want to tell and that fascinate me. I do think this is an origin story. I do think what happened here, we're going to see again and again and again. I do think that there is a change in Wall Street that's happened that we're just coming to terms with that has to do with social media, which has to do with the ability of regular people to be a part of it, that they've never really a part of it before. Um, and at the center of it is risk. And I think without the willingness to take risk, you never move forward, nothing happens. Um, so, you know, if you are sitting on your couch and you don't risk that money, well, nothing's gonna change, right? So I do think it's a very American thing to go out there and actually take risks. Um, the question is, can the system as a whole be made less dangerous for the people who are willing to do that? Um, but the reality is, look, at some point, you know, the stories that get told are the ones about people who risked everything and won. Um, and you don't really tell the stories of the people who risked everything and lost. Um, and so maybe I'm part of the problem by, by dramatizing the winners over and over again. I mean, not everyone's going to end up the Winklevi twins. Um, but, but I do think that that is a very American thing. It's a very, a very American thing to be willing to, to throw your money after something and, and see what happens. You know, I also uh, want to point out that a lot of times when – these people throw everything at it and risk everything and win. They've already lost multiple times to get to that point, and but they keep oh, yeah. you know doing it and doing it and doing it. And I think that is also very uh, stories that are told after they win. You know, like so you know the the Winklevi, you know they've been through their um, things. Obviously, they come from a privileged background, but they have lost a couple times along the way. And but um and especially you know the average re retail investor probably has their stories as well. Um, but when you get to that point, you also have those stories of hey, this is the risk I had this. Is the risk I have and now this is my final do you think that we should be telling those stories more about the the losers of of these uh games that of risk right one of the fascinating things about Wall Street bets and why I think it was so popular is people would post their losses uh, almost as much as they'd post their wins and the community gathered around I mean people made fun of each other and whatever but if you bet fifty thousand dollars on a stock and lost everything 
that post would garner more likes than if you won. Um, and I think that there is something about telling the story of the losses that is very important in sort of the disasters. And that's why in this book, I chose a few characters, not all of them made tons of money, um, because I wanted to tell all sides of that story. I do think it's important and, and, and something about us, we do kind of like to watch car crashes. <laughs> so I do think that there is something compelling about watching the losses uh, as much as there is about watching the wins. Uh, that's why I think th that Wall Street Bets became so popular. Um, and, and when Keith Gill started out, people were just making fun of him. I mean, he was saying, I'm, I'm long on G GameStop. This is gone. I'm putting all my money in GameStop. And people were like, what are you doing? You're nuts. And I think that sincerity and the willingness to lose everything was what galvanized the audience. Ben, where can everybody find your book? Uh, the Antisocial Network is out. It's everywhere. It's in your local bookstore. It's on Amazon. Um, it's also, you can come to my Twitter at Ben Mesrick, and I'm sure I'll be posting about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the book is everywhere right now, and it will be turned into a movie over the next year, which will be really cool to watch. And we're getting some great directors and actors together at this point. And um, so, yeah, it's it's going to be everywhere. Hopefully, you'll, you'll see it in any store you walk into. Ex excellent. I'm an audiobook guy. I, I'm assuming there's an audiobook. Who's reading there the audiobook? audiobook? A wonderful, wonderful uh, voice artist did it. It's it's uh, really compelling. I think audiobooks are awesome. I'm I'm a big fan of them as well. So um, yeah, check it out. I hope hope uh, hope it's a it's a good listen. Author Ben Mesrick, thank you very much for coming on the show, talking to us about this. And you know, it's always good to see you. I can't wait for your next book. I appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me.